Very good evening, Ambassador Haim Karim. Good evening to all of you. I'm very thankful that you have provided us with your time. I know that you have a busy life. Yeah, but luckily so. It's very good to be busy. I uh, uh, started my uh, academic path uh, learning about Islam and the Middle East. And by the time it became so interesting that through learning about the Sawuf or Sufism, I came across knowing uh, all kind of uh, Sufi orders in many places, specifically in Sudan, when I was concentrating in uh, Halwatiya uh, uh, Tariqa and also in uh, some other Tariqas, the Samania, the Tariqa that the Mahdi Muhammad Ahmad came from in the 19th century. And later on, I came across to the Majdubiya then. And that was so interesting to me that I tried to find out some other issues uh, uh, and places that uh, connected to, to Sufism. And I came to know more about Central Asia and about Turkey. And even in Israel, we have few uh, uh, Turuk in uh, Acre, we have the Shazliya and Bakal Garbiya, we have uh, some others. So I'm really active in that. But in my other life, I. Uh, became a diplomat and uh, using my knowledge at Arabic and Islam, I happened to come uh, and to serve in the Arab world. I was ambassador to South Sudan, I was ambassador to Egypt, and also I happened to be in Mauritania for a while, which is also a very close to Senegal, which is well known by its uh, uh, Sufi tradition. So. I combine my academic uh, track with my diplomatic life, and not only it's worthy, it's very interesting to me. That's very interesting. That's uh, very interesting that you have uh, an interest in Sufism, and uh, as a career, uh, you chose diplomacy, and uh, you are inspired with the Sufi trends of Sudan, and now your country which you served as a diplomat, is having good ties with Sudan. Right, right. How was uh, Egypt, Ambassador? How was yeah, Egypt? I, I'm sure that you, uh, during your life and experience, you came uh, across with the tradition, the Jewish tradition of mysticism and Hasidut, which is a very close to Sufism. It's closer that people tend to understand the Hasidut movement from the 16th century, which basically was very close to Islam, both here and also in Eastern Europe, uh, reflected each other uh, very similarly by principles. And then my surprise was so uh, fascinating when I came to know about Sudan, listening to the words, some of the words of ceremonies, not only in Zawiyas or in, 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 other, uh, 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 in other events, but to see even the words, which is the same words in Hebrew and Arabic, when you, it came, it, it coming to usage of, uh, of uh, rituals, of uh, Muslim rituals and Jewish rituals. For example, when you're talking about Eid al-Adha, uh, the famous uh, uh, festival, uh, the famous important uh, Muslim, in parts of Sudan it's called Aid al Korban. Korban is a Hebrew word, that's the original word of Adha, which is very interesting. And when you're talking with our disciples of mysticism, they're also using terms that are coming from uh, Arabic. So it's extremely interesting to my daily life and daily work. And I think I live through it. And it's not only a career that I'm using it as a diplomat or academic. It's more than that. It's uh, admiration of this way of life, uh, identification with it. It's, it's very important to us. That's very true. That's very true. I was uh, just wanted to ask you about um, 
your experiences in Misr, uh, in Egypt, like you spend your career uh, time in Egypt. Egypt is a mystical place where you find many uh, tariqas, many Sufi orders. So how was, there There were two aspects of my question. How was your diplomatic life in a Muslim country? One. Second, how did you explore the mysticism or the Sufi orders in Egypt? Egypt is a uh, is very interesting story in that sense. Uh, you know that uh, I, I served twice in Egypt, was as a consul in Alexandria in the 80s, and then as an ambassador uh, a few years ago. So uh, what happened is that I was astonished then in the 80s why a scholar like Abu Alai al-Mawdudi, whom you know very well, is so influential in Egypt. And he's definitely was not carrying a Sufi uh, a Sufi way of thinking. So in Egypt, the traditional way of Orthodox Islam, of Al-Azhar and so on, it's not coming along very well always with Sufism. You know better than the others that in traditional Orthodox Islam, there are elements who dislike Sufism or even fought or still fighting Sufism because they're, uh, they're saying that it's not real Islam. You're probably aware to that more than the others, uh, which to my mind it's not true, but I'm not the one who decide about that. But it's, it's in interesting because in those countries, like in Egypt or Sudan, I just remind you that Hassan al-Turabi, the guy who led the extremist Islam in, in Sudan for more than three decades, he's originally from Sufi origin, and he changed his views. So in Egypt, you can find uh, side by side many Sufi orders living very close in Cairo, for example, big neighborhoods. Uh, I. I visited zawiyas and, 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 and bookstores, Sufi, very important, very interesting bookstores in Cairo. But uh, when you're coming to speak with the establishment, they are not always extremely happy with that. They recognize that it exists, but uh, I think in Sudan is more extreme. The changes that Sudan used to be a real Sufi society, and it has changed by the years, and now it's different. So it, it's very uh, uh, interesting to me to meet Sufi leaders or Sufi people, and uh, it, in fact, it's easier to me to come closer to them in connections because they understand me be, uh, when we uh, have talks about nature, for example, mm -hmm. or if we're analyzing uh, the poetry of uh, uh, um, um, Shams or uh, or uh, uh, the poet uh, 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 from Damascus buried in Turkey in uh, uh, he's well known all over the world, and you analyze mm -hmm. a, as a non-Sufi. You analyze his poetry about moving around all the time and internalize uh, things mm -hmm. and coming close to the nature. How how it's important that working Allah from your heart and with love, the love uh, how it's important. That is very close to the Suf to the Jewish way of worshiping God. So it's sometimes easier to me to get close to Sufi people. And I met a lot of Sufi leaders from Central Asia, from Uzbekistan, from Kazakhstan, and, and some other places. And, and we became really close, understanding the main principles of it. So in Egypt, it's more, um, uh, it's more going through the, orthodox way. So uh, it's not contradictory 
necessarily, but it's not the same. So, uh, well, of course, uh, when you are coming to uh, to a mosque in, in in Israel, there's a village well known as its Sufi origin called uh, Bakal Harbiya, and they they invited me to their mosque to take part on the ceremony, which is very kind of them, very nice of them. And, 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 and that is a great experience to me. This is fascinating. This is a, a fascinating part of your life story. Uh, how, how do you think, let me, let me uh, talk to ambassador first, not the Sufi part of you. How do you think that Sufi diplomacy can bridge two societies? How do you comment on the importance of Sufism in different regions and religions? And how do you see it as a connecting force? I believe uh, that people basically there's a discussion about it but basically people are good basically inside when you enable people to be free of mm. pressures or uh, habits that derive from rea different realities from conflicts and so on and coming to your inner belief, I believe, and I, I experienced that myself, that I felt very comfortable from Sufis, um, including from Pakistan, that used to come here to visit. We have a few centers uh, of the Ahmadiyya in my home city in Haifa. It's a very famous uh, community in Israel or elsewhere, but not only from Pakistan. Uh, uh, and when few rabbis, orthodox rabbis, are believing in the same principles of Sufis, and I brought them to meet Sufi sheikhs, there was a big love there, not only understanding and so on. So it definitely works on common grounds that uh, we believe in the same principles. Uh, even in ceremonies, when our uh, Hasidim going to the forest, shouting, when you shouting Allah, Allah, they shouting Father, Father, and they talking freely to the to God. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very, very important. The uh, this basic uh, connection to Allah, to nature, to to uh, uh, using love as a mean. Mm -hmm. I think it overcomes everything because it brings understanding. And I experienced that together with uh, Muslim brothers, uh, Sufi brothers, that uh, we experienced together, including ceremonies. And when we agree about principles, and we, mm -hmm. we have short time, so we're talking about the very basic things. I'm not coming to, to go inside the deep think, thinking of great thinker like, mm. uh, like Al-Ghazali or, or people like that, or even Arabi and so on, that they have a great mind. We have a same problem in Judaism when the mainstream people thinking about our Sufis, the Jewish Sufis, that they are a little, little bit simplistic and they believe in, uh, uh, in ceremonies instead of in philosophy, that's not true. Our famous, there's a rabbi called Nachman from, from Bratlaw, probably you heard about him. And people, Jewish people, laugh at him because he was simplistic. But when you read his writing, you understand how deep it is. It's not only a matter of love. And, and I know from my reading in, in, in Sufi, uh, uh, Sufi readers, not only from your era, <laughs> from India, Pakistan, and so on, but from Central Asia and from Turkey yeah. and from Sudan as well. I can see how deep the people are, and the whole ceremony of 
moving around, which symbolizes so much uh, uh, to us, it's also uh, a very important principle in Judaism as well. So, uh, uh, in our our year, it's agricultural year. We understand what nature means, uh, uh, how you depend on on, on working land and, and and soil and and the, the seasons, and we are. Our year, it's a year that based on that. So we uh, we understand it. So uh, we have few, we don't have many Sufis in our area. We have few, but we are in a very good connection with them. And they are involved in, in our life, in our society, which is extremely important to me. And most of my connections also in Egypt and Sudan started with... Uh, uh, with Sufi heritage. Uh, when I started my research about uh, uh, Sudan, it was based on Arabic archives in, in, in Western Sudan. Uh, and I then came as an historian. And my professor, who is a well-known professor, told me if you don't go deeply into that, you won't understand society. And he was right. I agree that it's not enough to learn the written scripts. That's nice, it's important for the research, but uh, when you come closer to the other as human being, and you understand the environment, and, and you find very easily the connection the, uh, the, from heart to heart. I think you identify quickly uh, 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 things that come closer, and, and me and some our friends that you know some of them like Michael Barak and some others, yeah. we are we are like a, a lobby for Sufism within the academic uh, uh, academic uh, uh, group in Israel that promoting the understanding of Sufism here, and of course we have few Sufi friends here, Arab Sufis. A Muslim Sufi, leader. so we all creating meetings every now and then to preserve and to promote it. Hmm. Uh, that's that's very valuable work which you and Dr. Michael Barak and uh, friends like Dr. Nancy and others are doing. I really appreciate it, and that that is a connecting point between us people from here and people from there. Uh, Sufism connects us very well, and. Uh, uh, Ambassador, uh, I would like to know how you see the peace between Sudan and Israel now, how it will grow, what are the possibilities and what are the uh, future chances? That's not an easy task because uh, Sudan is a very complicated society and the regime, we just mentioned that, the regime had changed dramatically ever since the independence that they get in 56. Now, the differences uh, of the populations there is huge because in the northern part, the Arab Muslims that they consider themselves from Arab origin. They, some of them uh, uh, are thinking that they belong to uh, uh, Arab to the uh, uh, Hashem family uh, uh, from Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, more precisely to Jaal, the uncle of the prophet and therefore one of the tribes called Jaalin in, in Sudan. So the Arab Muslim by their identification and they were actually uh, was uh, was a very uh, close and then, then so, they're very uh, they're very close to uh, 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 to the Arab Middle Eastern politics. They followed after the time of the Mahdi in the 19th century and after the uh, end of the British uh, colonialism in Sudan, uh, they uh, decided to go uh, on the on the idea of not Sudan for the Sudanese, as happened in the Mahdi's time, but uh, to follow Abdel Nasser's uh, pan-Arabism. So they came to be a part of the Middle East. 
but the other populations, for example, in the southern part of Sudan, that today is a different independence country, South Sudan, they're basically non-Muslim, they are Christians or animists that converted to Christianity for many denominations, and they are from African origin, they are not Arabs. The third part is the western part of Sudan, named by Darfur, and they are Africans who converted to Islam uh, through a process of basically 300 years. That's my PhD. I worked on archive from there to see. Now, that's extremely interesting because due to Sufism that prevailed in Sudan at that time, they succeeded to convert to Islam in the best way because the structure of the uh, tribal system in Africa was fit exactly well to, uh, to, to Sufism. And instead of having a chief running a tribe, you have a sheikh that know how to read and write, knows the Quran, of course, using the Sufi principle of nature and so on. And that, that became very important part. But for Khartoum people in the north, they, not, uh, they are not real, uh, uh, they are not real Muslim because they are converted uh, by the way of Sufism and not the usual way of, uh, uh, and for example, Hassan al-Turabi that I mentioned before, uh, disliked them and he didn't consider them a, a true Muslim that created a lot of tensions between many populations of Sudan. So when the South was suppressed by the North, there was civil war from the independence that two million people killed uh, by this seventh civil war. So it's very deep. When they got independence, the, 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 the South supported us and we supported the, the South because the North, what called Sudan today, was in a war against us, hostile, uh, with the Middle Eastern countries then. Uh, now, after Bashir left, we're trying to have a new situation, we're talking about reconciliation, uh, if it will happen, and we're talking with the uh, 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 Arab Muslim leadership, which is not today, I wouldn't consider it Sufis at all. They are working according to the steps of Bashir and Turabi, which are, belongs to more radical Islam. If you like, they, would, they followed in the last three decades Ibn Taymiyyah, not, not the scholars of Sufism, which is very extreme, but the reality had brought them to a situation that they have to change not only their way of belief, but uh, the way of, of, uh, of uh, taking the new challenges. So in politics, in society, and so on. So if the Emirates and Bahrain decided to come to have a relationship with us, there's no reason why uh, uh, Sudan wouldn't do it as long as it, uh, it's uh, serving their interest. And they're in a very bad situation due to the fact that they were part of the countries in the list of terrorism and the sanctions that got from that by the US and the UN uh, brought them to a very bad situation and they would like to go out of it and therefore they're using us for that. Hmm. Now, I'm not saying it's coming from the art and they are uh, uh, started to be uh, lovers of Israel. But the reality brought them to be. But I must say that. But even here, when uh, in the era of Bashir, I, I wrote about that myself in, two seven, uh, in 2016 and 17, People in Sudan, including foreign minister, including Bashir itself, started to talk about establishing relationship with Israel for their own sake. And even, even people, uh, sheikhs, uh, 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 
belongs to the Muslim Brotherhood in Sudan, called for establishing relationship with us, and they said the Palestinian is not problem, and according to the Holy Quran, there is no problem to make peace with Jews. That uh, I believe you share this view too. So, uh, and they called from the religious part, as we saw spoke in the beginning that. From that, it's easier to be connected and to identify common grounds that we can work together, and not only the economical interest and, and some others, the real politics. And I believe in, in, in that, in the depths of the, the reality. Another issue which is uh, important to understand is that after the genocide that was in Darfur, by the way, based on the differences between the Arabs in Khartoum, headed by militia under Bashir, called the Ginger Whip, that actually convicted the genocide in between 2003 and 2005 in Darfur, based on the idea of Turabi and Bashir, that the people of, of Darfur are not Muslim enough because they belong to more traditional Sufi uh, tradition. Uh, the ICC brought Bashir to the court in order of convicting uh, crime uh, against humanity. And I, I bring it here in order to show you how complicated it is, which is the same territorial nation state called Sudan. There are differences. Now, we need to make peace with those that part of them are in charge or were responsible to this genocide, and we are not ignore them. We understand how difficult it is, and we must take it into consideration because we are all human beings. We cannot ignore the suffering of people, uh, and we need to raise it all the time and to make sure that it won't happen when we are uh, 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 making relationships uh, with that. That's one issue. The other issue, after that genocide, from 2006, people from Darfur started to run away from their own life, and some of them arrived to Israel, through Egypt, and they became refugees here. Now, when they came here, they called their relatives in Sudan, say, it's heaven in Israel, why don't you come here? And then people from other parts of Sudan came here in order to make money, not because they were from Khartoum, and they are not refugees. That makes it uh, a little bit complicated. And then it was very easy to, to penetrate here. Now, we, uh, we had, in a time, we have uh, around 16,000 Sudanese living here. The, some of them eight, nine, ten years. They're fluent in Hebrew, they know Israel, and they love Israel. Now, most of them, by the time, came back to Sudan. Now, according to the to the law in Sudan, any Sudanese can travel all over the world, but not to Israel. But they did. They come and they returned to Sudan and nothing had happened to them. They became back to their community, to the village, to the cities, and they became prosperous and start to talk to the people. But Israel is not a bad thing. So people, all the education from the time of Pan-Arabism, we it's not there because we talk about a new generation. So new generation with the social media, they are open-minded, they lived here. I see them ambassadors of peace between Sudan and us. And I'm in touch with them every day, both here and in Sudan. So, uh, they, and they're extremely happy with that because they tell other Sudanese, you don't know them. It's not what you were educated about. So. I think that not a lot from the first side, but the process by the time will bring us uh, closer together. As much as I believe, by the way, that one day we'll have good relations with Pakistan as well, based on connection with, with you, with Sufi. Uh, I think it's extremely important, although I happen to know your president in one event, I met him once when he was a famous uh, uh, player of, uh, uh, he was a champion on... Uh, uh, Cricket. Right, yeah. yeah. I met him. The Prime Minister of Pakistan. 
Yeah. His wife was Jewish from uh, yeah. British German Yeah, Jemima. Right. Yeah, but but uh, but I don't think he 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 works he uh, he walks in your path. But but I don't know. I don't know. No, he uh, is a but, Sufi, by the way. The prime minister hmm? is a Sufi. The prime yeah. minister is a Sufi. Yeah, right. he likes the Sufi path. But I believe there's no reason why uh, believers from Israel and from Pakistan cannot live in harmonious way together. I don't see any problem by that. When we're talking people to people and not politics, I don't see any problem with that. I will be happy that we promote it. Yeah. I completely agree. There is no direct problem with pa between Pakistan and Israel and people to people connections where they are. They are uh, very comfortable to talk to each other. And uh, we are hopeful and optimist about the future relationships between our two countries. And right now we are building the relationships between our two communities. And this is going good, by the way. This is going good. Yeah. If, you, if you're looking out about our modern history of our both countries, it's very similar. When you got your independence, we got our independence. When you became a Muslim state, we became a Jewish state. A Jewish state when we have more than 20% non-Jew, mostly Muslims. So uh, it, 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 it closed. There are some... Uh, I read carefully your history from Muhammad Jinnah and those times of how you became and your story with India. Which is very, and I follow your write, uh, writers and your uh, development in in a way of uh, of uh, being a religious country, which is mm. interesting, very to me, very much to me. And as I said before, I was really wondering how a scholar, a Pakistani scholar like Maulana Maududi, became yeah. uh, so influential. In the Middle East, that's still an enigma for me. I I I, I don't understand. But uh, as long as we can follow philosophy, writing, discussions, that is okay. We 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 don't have to agree about everything. As long as we have a discussions, and as long as our hearts are open, I believe that we have a common future together. So yeah, that's so true. And there is a need of agree to disagree as well. Yeah, that um, um, we uh, we have uh, we have a different uh, structure of a nation state. Okay, but I'm not in a position of judging anybody. Uh, okay. One of the problems of what we call the West, Europe, uh, Western Europe and the US is that they expecting that you and me and the Egyptians and the Sudanese will behave uh, along the principles that they living with. For example, they think democracy is a, is a state of the art. And we all should follow it, and so on. Now, I'm, we are democracy. I don't have anything against democracy. But I don't think that we, living here, have the right or should dictate anybody in my neighborhood how to, to run his own business. That means That's that right. we are surrounded by mostly Arab Muslim countries that are not considered democracy. So, if Anwar Sadat, the Egyptian, succeeded to come and make peace with us in 77 and came to Jerusalem, and he, is not, he was not considered democracy, would I reject the opportunity to make peace with him? Would I tell him what way he should run his own business in Egypt? I don't, I think it patronizing a little bit somebody else we're living in in, in, a, in in a certain reality 
uh, we have our neighbors and we need to, to live and try to live well with our neighbors mm. and not to dictate anybody. So we, we need to live uh, with, with whom we can live in the best way we can and try to identify what we have in common and not to tell anybody. Like I remember uh, President Obama used to tell to President Sisi, if you are not bringing modern brotherhood into the parliament, I put sanctions on you. And, and he was led by the principles of Orientalism, not to be paternalist, and that's exactly what he have done to him. And I don't think, even uh, twenty years ago, when there was intention to make peace with Bashar al-Assad, this very butcher, he's killing his own people. We didn't reject it, although we knew who he was. I'm not saying he's the best partner that we can expect for. But that's what we have. And as long uh, as we can identify common interests and later on become closer on basis of belief or love, that is okay for me. So uh, that's what I'm trying to say, that there's no reason why uh, a structure, political structure or even uh, political history should prevent uh, negotiations with uh, 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 and coming to agreement with you. I don't see any problem with that. We uh, consistent uh, relationship with China and India. India is close to you, you know it. To tell you that everything is great there in terms of politics, that wouldn't be the truth. But yeah. that is the situation and we can identify good people both in China and in India. And I know what, what you carry with you about India. So uh, uh, that situation, but in the end, we are all believers. We believe in God. Yes. Uh, we are all human beings. And I think that that will overcome and we definitely can go together. I agree with you, Ambassador. Uh... In fact, uh, about India, I have uh, a very clear view that uh, I always seek a peaceful, strong, prosper neighbor next to me. And especially when they are, there are more than a billion uh, people are living in a country, uh, I will I'll always wish them a good, happy and peaceful life and I expect the same gestures from their side as well. And I know that there are so many peace-loving people living in India. And of course, we are neighbors. We have a tough historical background. We have conflicts. We had wars. But still, I love the idea of negotiations and table talks, which my, my country always advocated in all the conflicts with uh, India. And I, I, I exactly want that model to replicate with the countries like officially Pakistan is not in good ties, even not in ties with Israel. So I say when my, my stance is when having differences and even wars with India, we are still ready to talk to them on peace. Why not with Israel, where we don't have any sort of conflict or war, directly or indirectly? That was Arab problem, and now Arabs are sorting it out. So why not? We should sort it out with Israel as well. Uh, I agree. I agree. Uh, but uh, but there are so many uh, uh, reinforcement on people and some painful history that people, some of them tend uh, not to overcome so quickly uh, when, our, but Egypt is a very good example. We had a bitter wars, many wars with Egypt yes. and people were killed and wandered <laughs> and, 
and we succeeded to overcome it. That's a big deal. You know what does it mean that I, that I happen to be a soldier in 73 war, in Yom Kippur war, and then I'm coming as an ambassador, sitting with President Sisi, who was a general in the army, talking about daily issues, about cooperation, civilian cooperation. What kind of feeling is that, uh, as you know, in my generation, I wouldn't believe that we overcome those obstacles and we, we cooperate. That's a wonderful feeling that uh, uh, that you you like you uh, fighting within yourself and you overcome and you can have a normal life with somebody that you were educated and you fought with before. Uh, so if we succeeded to have a peace and cooperation with them for more than 40 years, why not? What what problems we have with Pakistan? We have no problem. <laughs> I don't see any problem. On the contrary, we can cooperate not only on the on the basis of belief, but much more than that on um, education and uh, whatever you like in technology. So I I am an optimist in that sense. Yeah. And I think that uh, this is a place and this is a time where Sufi, Sufi diplomacy can play a vital role. Sufis can be a bridge between two countries and two communities. And Sufis are, we, we have shared culture of Sufism. Yeah. We have uh, shared heritage of Sufism. And uh, there are a lot to work on uh, there are so many common grounds where we can sit, where we can talk. And this is the matter of Corona and lockdown in Israel. Trust me, I am 200% uh, ready to visit Israel as soon as the airports are open and as soon as the society will uh, resume uh, in uh, normal functioning position. I am trying and I am I'm willing to visit Israel. Uh, very soon and hopefully we, you, me, Dr. Barak, Dr. Nancy and people like us, we can be able to sit together someday, somewhere and advance this uh, process of peace initiated by common people like us uh, and hopefully this will work soon, inshallah. Inshallah. We all hope and uh... Uh, we can say, uh, um, uh, by the way, you speaking Urdu or, or, uh, but you, you can read Arabic, of course, no? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so you can, you can read the Quran in Arabic, not in Yeah. Uh, we Urdu. usually read the Quran. Yeah. We usually read the Quran in Arabic. Yeah. Okay. Wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Haim. Uh, I am you. really grateful and that you provided me with your time. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Masala. Hope to see you soon. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.